days in the hospital. And I want to remember to keep Paul Lemon in our prayers as he's dealing with his leukemia. And Carolyn Snyder still has her brain in her hand and was put on antibiotics. And she has an appointment with an oncologist on Wednesday to get her chemo started. And Mike Vaughn is recovering from back surgery at home. He's doing okay. He's doing okay. And Angie Mollahan, uh, Angie Mollahan's grandmother, granddaughter, is recovering in Children's Hospital after being born 26 weeks. And her name is Mania Marie. And Regina Vaughn has been referred to a specialist at the Cleveland Clinic. And I want to remember Christina Robinson's daughter-in-law having medical problems. And Evelyn Duckworth, as she's recovering from the COVID. And Karen Metz is feeling bad this morning. And uh, while she's not here, she's got sinus and <coughs> problem her. And is there any other announcements concerning the sick? I talked to our neighbor yesterday, the one that was in the world and that had the heart cath, Carol McCart. I talked to her husband yesterday. The heart cath went good. They said that the heart was healing itself, and they were heart, they were heart surgery president this time. That's good. That's good. That's now his neighbor. Heart was healing itself. That's good. Uh, for the upcoming events, we have an elder preacher's meeting tomorrow evening at 6 30. If anybody has anything at all they want to discuss, uh, let one of the elders or elders know. And uh, June the 10th will be Ladies' Night Out at Western Sisman at 5 30. And Saturday, June the 12th, Intermediate Day Bible Camp at Revida. Uh, see Ellis for details on that. And next Sunday, be a potluck after the morning worship. Everyone's encouraged to uh, come and enjoy the great few food and fellowship. And Wednesday, June 16th through June the 19th, is a uh, senior week Bible camp at OVU. And just on a personal note, please remember like uh, today is a very important day in history. Remember the veterans and be thankful for what they've done for all of us here too. And uh, just remember the veterans. And is there anything else that needs to be on the uh, upcoming events? Okay, we'll turn it over to Mark. Six twenty-three. <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus! All our sins and grief to bear.
said and done here this morning will be pleasing in your sight. We pray that each one here might build, be built up in the faith. Father, we ask that you would be with those of our number that are sick, shut in, and unable to be with us. The reasons are many. And we have many in our congregation, Father, that are unable to be here, and we pray that you will be with each other. You will give them that portion of help that they so desire. Father, we ask that you would be with us as a country, that you would help us to elect leaders that are pleasing in your sight, that will follow your word and do the things that you have directed. Father, we ask that. You will bless the efforts here at this congregation. That you help us as we shine your light to those around us. Father, we thank you that this pandemic is, it seems to be easy. We finally have some relief from it. We pray, Father, that it will continue to abate, that we will be able to once again be out and move freely. Father, we're so grateful for all the many things that you bless us with and are much too numerous to mention. I pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us in the future as you have in the past. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for we've sinned against you. I pray, Father, for your guidance that we might recognize the temptations that Satan places before us and flee from. And we pray, Father, that when our lives here, we might have that happen and go home with you in heaven. It's through Jesus 
Jesus' name that we pray. Let's sing number 411. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, that's too high for me. Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving grace flowing down from the cross for me. There the dead for my sin. and what it should truly mean to us as Christians. And let's give thanks for the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to thee in prayer this morning. We pray that you will bless this bread as it represents the broken body that was hung on the cross. We pray that you will bless it and bless us as we partake of it. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Give thanks for the food of the body. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to in prayer once again this morning. We pray that you will bless this cup as it represents the blood that was shed for the, the forgiveness of our sins. We pray that you will bless it and bless us as we partake of it. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, but we also have the opportunity to live by the store.
There's baskets on the back table. If you haven't done so, you can do it as you please. Number 94, you step on it. Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand, he leads the way. And with each breath, I whisper, I adore thee, oh, what joy to walk with him each day, each step I take.
Let's sing number 22 for our next song. <clears throat> number 22. Angels are singing redemption sweet song. Wonderful thing, glorious thing. Shout the glad message and join in the throng. Singing redemption song. Singing the sweet song. Good morning. It is good to see everybody out there. Certainly glad you are with us this morning. I uh, want to mention our little conference last week. We were able to go, we appreciate the opportunity, able to go to the Connect Conference, the Connect Conference, and it was at the Creed Hall Church of Christ, and uh, Brentwood, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. Brentwood is where the stars live, although we didn't see any stars. But uh, it was such a wonderful event. Uh, I spent my birthday, and thank you everybody for the cards that have given me one. Appreciate that very much. But I spent my birthday in the auditorium, with, and, and this is what I was thinking when I did it. Over the, in the auditorium with over a thousand people singing praises to God. And I thought, wow, that's just, you know, you, you couldn't have a better gift than that. And that was so wonderful. 
Uh, what an opportunity. Um, we had, well, the first night I know we had over a thousand people. Uh, the official count was 1,003, then I think a group from Fried Hartman came in after that, so it was well over 1,000. Uh, 129 congregations, several from the uh, Mid-Ohio Valley here, were, a lot of people from Parkersburg were there. Um, I know some groups from Camden and North End and uh, Barlow Benz and other groups had gone to this. Um, so three different countries, and, and it was just a wonderful event. Uh, Phil Sanders was kind of the uh, the person who tried to put it together and with Alan Stevens. I don't know if anybody knows Alan, who used to be a member of North End. That's why there's so many people from this area there. But it was just a wonderful event. It was the first annual uh, Connect Conference. So I invite you, that I don't know that they introduced the date yet, but it will be about the same week in June next year, I assume. Um, you don't have to be a preacher to attend. It's for everybody. Certainly there were many uh, church members. It was put on by basically seven Nashville churches that came together and paid for it. So it's free. It's, it's wonderful. And our theme this year was making disciples, or disciples making disciples. So I'm uh, really all about sharing your Christian faith. And so it's just a wonderful time of uplifting and praise to God. And if you've never, I will tell you this, when we were singing songs, and, and it's great to have... 57 people here singing songs, but if you imagine a thousand people in a room singing praises to God, let me tell you, you do not need instruments of music. First of all, you wouldn't be able to hear the instruments. It, it was just, just so wonderful. I, I couldn't encourage you uh, enough to take a, a trip down there. It starts on Wednesday, runs through Saturday night. We left a little early because we had to get back and do some things, but uh, it was wonderful. Now I want you to kind of forget everything you've ever learned about this story of Jesus making or changing water into wine. I want you to kind of think that you've never heard the story because when we've heard the story or we know things about it, we automatically assume the, the end. When we put assumptions in our minds sometimes that really aren't there or that we want to assume. Now you can look at this story and say, well, Jesus, and there's really a couple ways to look at this story. People look at it in, in this way. Well, Jesus turned water into wine Therefore, Jesus thinks it's okay to drink, and, and, and so drinking is great, and so this is my justification for alcohol. Or some people look at it in, in the direct opposite way. So I want you to kind of not look at it anyway uh, this morning, and we kind of approach it together and kind of learn about it and, and look at it. Now, we began this lesson last week, and we really looked at the first five verses, and we left off with verse five, and Jesus, or, or uh, Mary, said, whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Whatever Jesus says to do, do it. Isn't that the same today? Well, we're going to see that more than one time, but just that really at one time in the story. So I want to kind of you know, picture this, if you will. Now, on the screen are, are kind of what they would look like, six watering pots, if you will. Now, these watering pots, let me get this uh, headed on anyway. Maybe. Maybe not. We have Mary's day. Kind of sign or something. You go, you go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's a triple A battery. John mentions these, these six watering pots, and the watering pots hold 20 to 30 gallons of water each. And together you have about 100 to 150 gallons of water. Now, so, so you can picture, this is not your typical wine, if you will. And that's what we kind of have to remember. It's not your typical wine. So you can picture these watering pots, uh, maybe enough to hold 20, gall 20 to 30 gallons of water. Right in the middle is 25, so if that's where you want to go, that's fine. Now, now they're not all the same size. 
and so we can see that they're not all the same size because we don't have the, you know, they weren't manufactured at a factory or anything like that. They, and when they, were, they were made out of clay, and so they weren't earthen vessels. So they had, the purpose of these watering pots were not for the beverages, for the drink. They were for the, the uh, if you see the verse there, it says, for the purification. The Jews had a purification that we do today. Did your mom ever tell you to wash your hands before you eat? Remember that? It's, it was the same thing there, only it was part of the oral law. They, they had to wash their hands before they ate. Not only did they have to wash their hands, but they had to do the dishes, just like we do. Now, they didn't have the dishwasher, but they had water. And so they would take that water, and they call this a process of purification. So if I'm washing my hands, it's purification. If I'm doing the dishes, it's purification. And many times they, they even had what we would call baptistry set up in, in the Jewish area, and, and they had cleansing, the purification of not only their bodies, but, but much of that was to get the dirt of things off, but they would also purify the, their cooking instruments and things like that. They had these bottles, the same bodies of water that they used for, for, for <coughs> baptizing. For a matter of fact, in First Corinthians, or First Peter 3 and verse 21, it says, when it talks about baptism, baptism now saves you not to remove of what? Dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience. That's what that's really referring to is because they would go down and baptize to remove dirt from the flesh. And it would be part of their process. And this process all began back in the book of Leviticus. This purification process. God wanted everything to be pure. And it's just like washing the dishes. So when you picture these six pots, I want you to picture basically dishwater. Now, how thirsty are you now? I'll give you a break. It's the dishwater before they did the dishes in it. So it might be uh, still clean. So it's not like you, you did a bunch of dishes in it. Now, now typically, the, the pots would not be all the way full because just like you wouldn't put your sink up to the rim, would you? And, and Because you have to do your dishes in it. So they would be down just a little bit. And, and, and so what we see in the text here, you know, and this is a good store of water necessary for the wash of hands. They also wash their feet in it, by the way, and, and their dishes and, and several things. John chapter 2 and verse 7 and 8 says that Jesus said, fill the water pots with water. Here's the command. So Jesus, you know, the mother, Mary, has had this conversation with the group. Mary's had this conversation with Jesus. Jesus, it's not yet my time. And Mary says, do whatever Jesus says to do. Whatever he says to do, do it. And so Jesus begins taking control of the situation. He says, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. So in other words, they, they went and filled. If they, if they had some water, they filled it up even higher. And said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master's feast. And they took it. So Jesus told the servants to fill the water pots with water. He then tells the servants that they did exactly what they were instructed. Drawing some out of the beverage to take it to the head waiter. The head waiter would, would then take it and then serve it. He's the head waiter. He's the master of the banquet. He's the one in charge charge. Draw some out and take it to the head waiter. What we see in John chapter 2 in verses 9 through 10, when the master of the feast had tasted the head waiter, had tasted the water that was made wine. You see, it, it, it seems to draw the picture that, that, that this head waiter is not there. He's running around. Oh, well, I got all these people and we're out of things to drink here. And, and what do I do? And, and, and over in this corner here, you can see the pictures of Jesus is making water to wine here. And, and so the head waiter really doesn't know what's going on over here. He's just over here dealing with everything that, that he has to do with the feast. And, and, and so, you know, the water made to wine, he, he didn't know where it came from. But the servant who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called for the bridegroom. And, and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. I want to look at some of these definitions in just a moment. That's what happens at your house, isn't it? The preacher's coming over. Put everything in the closet. Shut the door. Got those crackers from last year? Yeah, set those out. <laughs> you know, when you have somebody over your house where you do a little wedding banquet. Now remember the wedding banquets are not just a little banquet an hour or two and then they're gone, you know. The, the wedding feast can last a week long. 
and normally did in their culture. So it's a long feast. It'd be very, how can you feed? Can any, can anybody here pay to feed all of us for a week? Probably not. That's a lot of money. You know, for, if you do, you're going to debt to, to do that. Or, or take all your savings either, either way to do that, to pay, to feed all of us for a week. Well, you might be able to potluck on the 13th. We can do that. But, but feed us all every day? That, that's a process, isn't it? And, and to keep these people entertained all week long. So the head waiter is running, running like crazy. And he said to him, verse 10, every man that begins sets out the good wine. Says, uh, and, and so we do that. We, we, day one, we, we put out our best presentation possible. Okay, there's everything I got. Got the good stuff here. Got the cake. I got everything to go. And when the guests have well drunk, you know, you, you get some that are going to leave, maybe. You know, when, 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 when the party's, you know, you've been here four hours, the party starts to die down a little bit. Here's the, the, the you know, you got the Pepsi Cola and the Coca Cola. Then, then you bring the the, uh, the no name stuff out when they, the Aldi's Cola when they've been out there a while, you know. Well, it tastes the same, doesn't it? You know, the water was turned into wine. John didn't record how much of it was water, how much of it was wine. Now, common opinion is that all the water in the watering pots became wine. We're not told that, but it's common opinion. And in this action, Jesus provided an incredible gift to the couple who perhaps were poor or unable to make adequate provisions for the wedding guests. Now I want you to see this. Some see spiritual blessings in this miracle and the significance of that spiritual blessing. And here it is. Jesus always offers a abundant supply of gifts. You might say Jesus' love language is gifts. Isn't that true? <laughs> Jesus' love language is gifts. He, he likes to give us gifts. And, and it's so much so when Jesus is pleased with us, it, it's, it's like gifts are, are pouring down from heaven. Blessings are pouring down from heaven. You know, it's one of those storms where, where you better have something over your head and, 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 it's, and it's so hard that it's coming down that, you know, it's almost like hail coming down. And what it is, it's, it's, it's not hail, it's not rain, it's blessings coming down from heaven for us. And when we get in the mood, when we get in the mindset that Jesus is not blessing us, we've kind of gone off course because he is, he is pouring down the blessings from us. He wants to bless us. And the more we are obedient to the will of God, the more we, we follow the faith, the more blessing. And you can say, well, how do you know that? I can look at the entire Old Testament. I can look at all of the house of Israel and understand that Jesus gave blessings and blessings and blessings. For a matter of fact, in the book of Micah, he says, test me. Test me. And see if I don't pour down blessings upon you. Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, nor did they put new wine in wine skins. I want to back up for a second now. This word here is... Uh, Ornios, O I N O S. It's the Greek word there in the English pronunciation. And it is the most common word for wine used in the Bible. Now, the Greek language sometimes doesn't always transfer well to English language. For instance, there's not a separate word for grape juice in the Bible. You have wine and wine and wine. Then you have to take that word wine and divide it up. Say some of that wine is what? New wine, grape juice. For example, someone brings me up a cluster of grapes. Someone gets me a big bucket here, brings me up, here's all these grapes, all this. We can do this some Sunday morning if you like. I take off my shoes and I do a Lucy ball and I make grape juice. It'd be a little fun, wouldn't it? You step on all those grapes and the juice pops out. And then 
Somebody comes up, Mark comes up, and scoops up all the juice, separates the peels from the juice. Maybe we've got a little drain at the bottom, that'd be nice. And then we have communion. I don't know if you want to. I washed my feet today, so I don't know if you want to have communion after. That's grape juice, isn't it? What, what was that wine made? It was made right in the stage in front of us. It was made, it's new wine. It was just made. Have you ever drank an old grape juice? I think there's some back. If you're very honest with you, this is no secret. We started serving, stopped serving back March last year in the big containers. But we'd take a big bottle of grape juice and pour it into the little cups. I think there's a bottle back there from last March. Usually we bought it a couple months ahead of time, so it's probably back there from last January. Who wants to take it home and drink it today? What's it going to taste like? It's going to be a little, Ugh. For a matter of fact, if you're lucky, you might have a little something floating in it. What is that? That's old wine. And then I have a, another wine that when I, I begin the fermentation process to where it turns into alcohol, then I have a third type. So we have these three things. We have one word for three different things. So we get kind of a little confused on, on what this is here. And in Mark 9 verse 17, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spoiled, the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into new wineskins, and they are both preserved. Genesis chapter 9 verse 21, then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his death. So, you know, it's like, okay, this is Noah. You know what Noah's big error was? This is verse. Well, what did Noah, Noah go back up? Three chapters. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6 had Noah found favor with God. God looked down, he saw Noah and said, this is a righteous man. This is a good man. This is a wonderful man. And, and he said, Noah, Built the ark, and he built the ark, and he was out on the ark, and everybody else died in the rain. And, and, and then the, the ark comes ashore, and you see this. His, his sons get him drunk, basically, or, or he gets drunk, and, and then from his drunkness, horrible things happen. Why would you say that the alcohol in that case was good or not good? I would say not good, because it, it led to some horrible things that happened to a good man. I will go on to Genesis chapter 19. <clears throat> you say, come, let us make our father drink wine. This is Lot. Lot had a lot of problems. We can back up and see Lot's life, and, and Abraham and Lot were together, and, and basically they couldn't live in the same area. I can't live with you. I can't live with you. Where do we go? We have all this land. Abraham says, Lot, you pick your land. Lot picks it, aim towards Sodom. Well, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, don't we? Abraham picks it, aim towards the promised land. You know, that story goes on like So Abraham or Lot chose to raise his family in a morally corrupt area. He lost his wife because his wife kept looking back because she she had a long, must have had a longing for sin because she kept looking back and had a sin. And now we're down a little bit in time. Let us make our father drink wine. These are our daughters. We will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their fun. They, 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 let's get daddy drunk. So he'll do things he doesn't want to do. Well, would you say this is a good use of alcohol or bad use? Well, it seems like a bad use. And the firstborn went and laid with her father, and he did not know she laid down with him when she arose. Or Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. 
the writer Paul would say, do not be drunk with wine. You say, well, wait a minute, this same guy, I know this, I know this. The same guy, the Apostle Paul said to, to Timothy, a preacher, said, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. First Timothy, yeah, he did say that, didn't he? First of all, you drink the water back then, and it's not good water to make you sick. And they didn't have what we have for stomach aches or, or anything else. So they, you know, I, I grew up with a bunch of Baptists. Now let me tell you, Baptists in general don't believe in drinking alcohol. But they, they love NyQuil. <laughs> so a Baptist at the counter one time, they're going to this and said, what you got there, 17 bottles of NyQuil. Party at my house, you know. Here's the message. Don't be drunk with wine, which is this quotation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, we see these three different, in the Grecian Roman world, and presumably in the, the Palestine of Jesus' day, three kinds of wine use here. First, the fermented wine, which we kind of looked at this a little bit which usually was mixed with a portion of two or three parts of water to one part of wine. So if there's a bottle, bottle brought it down there, I don't grab this, I think somebody's, but say you had a water bottle, basically, so you're, you're pouring out a good portion of the water, mixing it with like one third or, or two thirds of, of wine. So it's, it's, it's just a weak mixture, if you will. Secondly, new wine, which we're talking about here, we see new wine, and, and we see it's made of grape juice and similar to cider, but it's not fermented. Wine becomes dangerous, if you will, to get you drunk when fermentation process takes. And thirdly, wines in which by boiling the unfermented grape juice, the process of fermentation has been, has been stopped and the uh, formation of alcohol prevented. And, and so you see these there, as we know for certain about what Jesus made, we don't know for certain about what Jesus made at the wedding, but we know that it was good wine, and the servants were aware that the origin of the wine was the head waiter, um, and, and upon tasting it, he called the bridegroom and told him that he had acted um, contrary to the cultural practice, and normally the good wine was of course put out at the beginning, and, and then the poorer wine was offered only after the guests had drunk freely. So the head waiter was in no doubt uh, pleasantly surprised that the bride, bridegroom has reserved the good wine. Now, I want you to think about this. You can still say, well, um, I think it's okay to drink. You might say that. And, and, uh, will you go to hell for drinking? I'm not going to say that, but I'll say, I'll say this. Um, more than getting drunk, what if you showed up at church this morning like you did, and you had driven by yesterday and saw me at the bar and said, isn't that Elvis's car? I have a very unique plate, so you can probably tell it's me. And then I, you, you thought, I'm going to check this out. I want to see him at the bar for myself. And, and you pop into the bar, you go walk into the bar, and there I am sitting at the counter. I've got an empty beer glass next to me. And a full beer glass in front of me. Now, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? How can he get up there Sunday morning and say all this stuff and be at the bar on Saturday night? Where's my limit to what I drink? Is it the two beer limit? Well, a little bit of drunk isn't going to hurt. A little bit of, little bit of alcohol is not going to hurt. A little bit of drunk is not going to hurt. Well, we could take that and say, well, I'm going to put that on every sin. Can I do that? A little bit of lying isn't going to hurt. A little bit of fornication is not going to hurt. A little bit of adultery is not going to hurt. Could we do that with every sin? A little bit of stealing is not going to hurt. A little bit of smoking pot 
during office hours in a hurry. See, we could take that same thing and apply it to, you know, if you saw Elvis, I guarantee you there would be an elders meeting after church this morning if Elvis was at the bar last night and you caught him. And Mark and Mark and Ed would be saying, all right, what do we do now? Someone saw Elvis at the bar. Well, was it a credible witness? Yes, it was. But we need to bring him in and what? Talk to him. Find out why he was there. And my reputation, I could lose my job. That would be if, or maybe, you wouldn't know. And my reputation for future jobs would be gone. Why did you get fired from Sunrise? Well, they called me to bar drinking. You picture a church that's going to hire me? No. Now, is there anything special about me over you? No. Your job may not require you to do that, but your job as a Christian, we are saints. We are set apart for a special purpose. Mark Blackwelder, in his writing at Fried Hartman University 2008, says this about this subject. It is a mistake to assume that what was considered good at that time is identical to what was considered good today. In other words, the wine, good wine. To assume the same thing in their culture that's in our culture today, it is a mistake. Plenty, the elders said, wines are the most beneficial when all their potency has been removed by the strainer. Jesus' wine was both good, good wine because it was a high quality and it was new wine just made, not aged, so that it would not be intoxicated. The fermentation process had not started. The text simply says that the wine Jesus produced was superior to the wine that had been served earlier. Jesus' emphasis is on excellence of quality of the wine Jesus produces is consistent with the nature of his works recorded throughout the gospel. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Woe to him who gives who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to the bottom, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. This is a, 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 a sobering, if you will, verse. I'm going to hand a drink to my neighbor. We call it, sometimes you just call that a good neighbor, don't you? Well, it's a Coca-Cola. That might be all right. I give him a beer or wine or, or alcohol. This might be a little different. He, well, he says, I'm a, he's a, a back of the saying this, he's accusing me of pressing, you know, if you ever had someone who's a recovering alcoholic, what do you not do? You do not give them a drink. That's the last thing you do. Because you give them that one drink. What happens? This is the, the picture that that Habakkuk is really drawing here, pressing him to the bottom, he, even to make, you know, if he, it's associating that one drink with, with almost being drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. Well, why does Jesus put this chapter in the Bible anyway? It's talking about, you know, if Jesus didn't want you to drink, why did Jesus say, don't drink? In that story. That would be a little easier. Well, he puts this, chapter in the Bible for this reason, for belief in what Jesus says and what Jesus can do for you. And that's what we really want to get out of this lesson this morning. It is what can Jesus, can you imagine that having dishwater and Jesus turns it into something you can drink? In our day and age, it would be fruit punch. That's what we serve at weddings most of the time. You serve a, you put some sherbet and with some seven up and, and you know, it's fruit punch. 150 gallons of it. And it's good fruit punch. It's not spiked fruit punch. It's good fruit punch. Well, 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 can you believe in what Jesus can do for you? And this is the beginning of his miracles and signs. What can Jesus... I, I want you to think, in 2021, what can Jesus do for me? Whether you're a Christian or, or not this morning, what can Jesus do for me? He, he can do several things. Look at John chapter 2 and verse 11. This is the beginning of signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples, his followers, believed in him. 
The more I see Jesus do something, the more I'm going to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. When we look at uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 20, and they looked out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word through, a, through accompanying signs. The, the reason that Jesus turned dishwater into something to drink is that he wanted people to see that, hey, I'm someone special. I am someone with the power of God, someone that can save your soul. John 20 and verse 30 and 31 says, And truly Jesus did many, many other signs in the presence of his followers, the presence of the disciples, which are not written in his, this book. Can you imagine what Jesus probably did? You know, it's true they didn't write everything down. <laughs> But these are written that you may believe. Here's the purpose. What they did write down, what they did tell us about, uh, are spectacular. If, if someone, if John's back there working, he brought up a, a you know, a, a jug of, of dishwater, and I took that dishwasher water and, and I shook it, and all of a sudden it's it's fruit punch or wine or whatever you have. You guys would be, wow, how did he? You'd be astonished, wouldn't you? Well, you think that's first. You think that's trickery. Then when you figure it out it wasn't trickery, you'd say, well, wow. But when you find out it's the Son of God, that, that he wants to rain blessings down upon us, that he loves us so much. You know, why are they there? Why is Matt, the book of Matthew there? Why is the book of Mark, Luke, and John there? For us to believe. For us to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He said, well, I've been a Christian for, for years and years and years. Well, well my, your faith can grow. My faith can grow. I, I get closer to the cross every day. I like that verse in Colossians that says, or it might be Galatians, that says that the cross is a, a tutor, a schoolmaster. Schoolmaster. It's bring us closer to the cross. And, then, and, and, and so that's certainly our Christian life where we're being brought closer to the cross. Our belief every day is stronger and stronger and stronger in Jesus Christ. And, and I want you to think back to the, the day that you were baptized into Christ if you're a Christian. How was your faith then? You might say, well, I just come up out of that water. I was on fire for, for God. I was like, this is great. I'm a Christian. My sins are washed away. They're gone. And, and, and this is great. But, you know, I've lived so many years. I've seen so many things. And, and, and it's kind of like the old boulder. You know, it goes for 250,000 miles, but it barely started anymore. Hey, that's your faith right now. You're just kind of running out of gas. I hope that your faith begins to start back up. Maybe you haven't become a Christian. Where do I start? I want you to know that you have God that made you. Made me. Made you. We're not perfect in any way, shape, or form. But our God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. What was the purpose of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? What is the purpose of Jesus? That the purpose of all these things is to bring us closer to heaven. And when I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I have that moment with him, and this is just a moment with God and me in prayer saying, God, I'm sorry for all those things that I have done. I, I repent of those things. I am going to try to make my life straight, try to make it right, try to not repeat the same mistakes. Will I, will I always succeed? No. But will I have struggles? Yes. And I confess that. I, yes, I do believe. And, and then I go down in, in the watery grave of baptism, and, and that's where I come in contact with, with the blood of Jesus. 
Because Jesus died and was buried and, and rose again. And I will rise again out of the water grave of baptism to, to be a Christian, to walk a new life. And, and whatever I can write, every sin I've ever done down on a chalkboard. And when I go down in that water, it's like that chalkboard just disappears. It's gone. My sins are forgiven. I, I have a new slate. I have a Savior that loves me. And if there should be a sin that appears on there, he is just and righteous and will forgive me as long as I walk in the light as he is in the light. Oh, we have a God that loves us so much. He loves us so much. He wants the very best for us. If you need to respond to the gospel message today, once you come as we stand, as we sing. There is a place of quiet. songs of praises to you, Heavenly Father, and express our love for you and for each other. Pray, Heavenly Father, to bless the congregation that meets here. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give us strength, give us purpose, so we might spread your word throughout the community. Pray, Heavenly Father, for the sake of our number, as we bless them and bless their families. Go with us now, Heavenly Father, bring us back to the next point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.